okay for your, uh, your camera, the light is okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do we have any more books or no? If not, I have some. For, I can bring some more next week. But I can... okay, I'll bring some next week. Um, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Um, I have copies of the intention. For anyone that forgot their intentions, um, I do not have copies of books today. But is there anyone that needs a copy of a book? Because I do have more. Okay, so next week, inshallah, I'll make sure to bring you um, copies, inshallah ta'ala. A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Radhi Allah ta'ala anhu wa al-kafit al-mu'mineen. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlu l'uqdatan min nisani yafqahu qawli أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. If I could have how many people need a copy of the intentions for the sisters and two, three, four, five. okay. If I can have one sister come and just take a few, pass it out to the ones that don't have it, and for the brothers as well, just take a few. Um, any sister or brother that doesn't have a copy of the niyyah of the intention, please take it. As it is our custom to to uh, recite our intentions before everything we do, of course, before the dars. Ideally, this intention is supposed to be memorized, either in Arabic or in English. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Let you memorize it, inshallah. Take it with you to class every single week. Not just to this class, but any Islamic class or any academic class, for that matter, that you have any dars, so that you can do... Uh, tajdeed of your intention uh, anything you do should be along these lines this is all includes, inclusive jamia and it excludes anything that's used this mania so let's have someone read it in Arabic as is customary and then in English who wants to yes please thank you sister <coughs> everyone Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen نوي تو التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله والسنة الرسول والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ورضاه وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى Someone in English please? Yes, read. In the name of Allah In the name of Allah The merciful, the ever merciful The merciful, the ever merciful all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. The Lord of the world. The Lord of the world. I intend learning and teaching. I intend learning and teaching. Reminding myself and reminding others. Reminding myself and reminding others. Benefiting myself and benefiting others. Benefiting myself and benefiting others. Encouraging people to hold fast to the book of Allah. Encouraging people to hold fast to the book of Allah. And the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. Calling people to guidance. Calling people to guidance. Guiding people to good. Guiding people to good. And in doing all this. And in doing all this. Seeking the countenance. Seeking the countenance. Pleasure. Pleasure. Nearness. Nearness. And the reward of Allah Most High. And the reward of Allah Most High. Very good. Okay. Let's continue. Today we're going to run, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to try to finish this section, inshallah ta'ala, so we can progress better. Page 30. Page 30. We're continuing to talk about the characteristics, the sifat, the traits that we should be, that we should rid ourselves of. Anger. 
It is the blood, it is that the blood of the heart boils with seeking vengeance. It is related that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, O children of Adam, this is Hadith Qudsi, Yabna Adam, O child of Adam, remember me when you become angry, so that I might remember you in my anger with you. Now this is very important. This line here you should underline, put a you know hashtag it, whatever you need to do. <laughs> this is the what you do to curb anger. Remember that when you get angry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to get angry with you too. So you need to watch yourself in your behavior. And that I not count you among the people that I annihilate. And that I not count you, not your. Correct that please. Not count you, not your. And that I not count you, not your, among the people I annihilate. Just as you don't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to become angry with you and get rid of you, when people do something wrong, don't let your first reaction be anger and be to punish them and to, to, to abuse them and to go over bounds. Imagine the kind of mercy you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to show to you and that's what you should model in front of other people. So there's another hadith Qudsi which is very powerful where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that O child of Adam were it not if it were not for the innocent children that are around you and the innocent animals that are around you I would seal up the heavens and the earth and you would receive no risk. Because of the innocent things that are around us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to have mercy to us when we disobey him when we uh, 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 deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his rights, when we don't follow his commands. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has the ability to get angry with us one time and to wipe us out. But he doesn't do that. He gives us time after time, chance after chance, opportunity after opportunity. We have two more books here. This, uh, there's a sister that asked for a book and there's the sister behind you. One behind you and the sister up front here, in the front. And those who don't have a book, please share on with some, share with someone who does. Uh, inshallah. Do you guys have sisters? You have a book? You guys, brothers? You okay? Okay. So Allah Taala gives us time, time, opportunity, after opportunity, opportunity, chance after chance. So we should model that same behavior with other people. Be patient with them and try to try to lower, uh, correct ourselves. The best deeds, the best of deeds, is gentleness in anger, and patience when overcome by our passions, our hawa. Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deters anger. So the moment we become angry, we should think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might deal with us when He's angry with us. And however we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to act towards us, if He's angry with us, whatever compassion we want Allah to show to us, whatever rahmah we want from Allah, that's what we should show to other people. Very important. Very important. Whatever behavior you want from Allah, you show it to other people. And that is how you begin to control your temper and your anger. Right. The Prophet ﷺ, when the man asked the, the Prophet ﷺ for advice, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Awsini, give me advice. Qala Nabi ﷺ, La taghdab, don't become angry. Faraddada mirara, and the man in, uh, repeated his request several times. And the Prophet ﷺ said, don't become angry, don't become angry, don't become angry. Yeah, and it doesn't mean don't become angry. It means when you become angry, don't act like an angry person while you're in a state of anger. Don't let your anger control your actions. It doesn't mean you don't have anger, but you do not become a victim of your anger. Such that you be, make someone else a victim. So, fear, Allah, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deters anger, it prevents it, such that when people... When we see people who are angry, it shows that they are veiled, mahjub, yani, from witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the doer of everything that is done in the realm of being. Yani, many times we have to understand also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the true fa'il, the true doer of everything. Instead, they, somebody get back some, home. that's my son over there, my son. tell him to quiet down. See, I didn't get angry. <laughs> this is, uh, those of you that want to teach, I'll tell you now. The worst, the worst, scariest thing about teaching is that everything you teach, you'll be tested on. 
every single thing. You give a notice about patience, Allah will put something on your plate that day, that night, next day, and you have you be tested on everything you say. And then you, Allah will hold you accountable to everything that comes out your mouth. Very scary thing about teaching. Very scary. It's not a khutbah I gave, except that that week I was tested on everything I talked about. You know, I wish I'd talk about a million dollars. <laughs> Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Instead, they attribute what occurs to their own kind. Okay. One of the scholars said, very powerful quotes, if you do not see that Allah is the doer of all, if you don't understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does everything, yes, people have choice, yes, people make decisions, but over everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control, in control of everything. If you don't see this, you instead perceive each of us in, in his own charge. If you don't see that Allah is in charge, then you see that the person is in charge. Now what does that mean? That means that you believe at that moment that that person has more control than Allah. Very scary thought. So if you don't perceive Allah as in charge actively, then you perceive the person as in charge. You don't for and you forget Allah. So the people, the Ahl al the people of the heart, always keep everything in perspective. Yes, people do things. Yes, people make decisions. Yes, people make choices. But within that choice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still in control. Person may, may, may decide to kill. They make that choice. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who allows the person's to, to, to carry that out. You see, the, the bullet does not leave the gun except with the permission of Allah. The fire does not burn except with the permission of Allah. Okay. Nothing happens except with the permission of Allah. So any, even though people decide, people choose, it's still with the permission of Allah that those things that happen continue to happen. One of our teachers said it very powerfully. He said, if you stand up, Books, one behind the number, are, are, are dominoes, methanin, and you tip one, and it hits the other, and it hits the other, and it hits the other. He says, the mu'min is the one that understands that Allah is in control here. And when this book falls, and it hits that one, Allah is in control there, and there, and there, and there. At every single step, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. It's not cause and effect in the materialistic world. There's no cause and effect outside of the, of, of the power of Allah. That's what we're saying. The power of Allah is present. The will of Allah is present at every single junction, every single moment. Okay? So this awareness has to be there. So what's the point? The point is when people get angry or you yourself feel yourself getting angry or you see someone getting angry at you, you have to also understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is actively working there also. Okay. And either that situation is a test for you, or it's a test for them. Usually both is the case. Indeed, the person who is complete, yani the person who is complete, the person who's camel, the person who uh, is very developed in the spiritual path, that's what we mean by camel or complete, very developed who is mature in the, in, the, in, the, in the tariq, in the spiritual path, the person who is complete does not become angry except for the sake of Allah. When his prohibitions are breached, yani when someone crosses, does something haram. The act of disobedience of ma'asi is not attributed to Allah, but instead to the servant of Allah. Okay? So when somebody does a mistake, right, commits a sin, we do not say out of adab, out of etiquette, we do not say, Allah did this. We say, the person did it. Okay, As I mentioned a couple weeks ago. When it comes to disobedience or bad things, out of, we don't say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that. Okay? But we have the understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of everything. But we don't say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala killed that person. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused, uh, 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 you know, Killed, the, killed this baby or something of that nature, when clearly there was somebody who killed the person. We said the person killed the person. 
But when it comes to good things, af'al al khayrat, then we say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say alhamdulillah. We don't say that any, take any credit for ourselves. Okay? <clears throat> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angered not for himself, but for other reasons. This is also very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets angry not for himself, not for his own self, but because of other things, other reasons. So even as a, as, a, as a person who's in a classroom, if you're teaching young students, uh, if you're a parent, uh, if you have, you have, you're an older sibling and you have a younger sibling, and they do something to offend you, you have to be very careful or you have to think about why you're getting angry in the first place. Are you getting angry because your nefs has been hurt? Because your ego has been hurt? Or are you getting angry because what the person did was haram in the first place? You get upset at your brother or your, old, your younger sister or your younger brother because of the way that they spoke to you or the way they spoke to your older sibling. Are you just taking up for them? Or are you upset because they are disrespecting someone that's older than them and the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to have ihtiram of those that are older than us. So the Prophet ﷺ, for example, he said, whoever does not show ihtiram for those that are older than you, and you don't show rahmah to those that are younger than you, فَلَيْسَ minni. You're not from us. You don't show respect to older people, you don't show compassion to younger people, you're not from our, from our group, you're not from Ummah Muhammad, you're from some other Ummah. So, someone offends you. They say something disrespectful to you and you start to be angry. You have to really think about what's going on. Are you angry because you think you're better than them? Or are you angry because they actually did something wrong? And so the, you have, we have to learn to separate the person from the behavior. Because the behavior is what we as Ummah Muhammad condemn. We don't hate thieves because their name is Ahmed, Muhammad, and Layla. We hate them because they steal. We don't hate people that do ma'asi because their name is so-and-so or their person is so-and-so. We hate the afa. We have to detach the person from the behavior. And our anger has to be detached like that as well. We become angry because of the behavior. Because that is what angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not for personal reasons. We have to be very careful about that. So this is what is being pointed out to us. If Allah, were Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek vengeance, to seek, seek revenge, for His own sake, He would annihilate the totality of all of His creation in a single second. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to act like us, sometimes someone hurts us, we want to strike back at them immediately. Right? And then we think about like the old, the old adage of, you know, I'll shoot first and ask questions later. Right? I'll respond first and then we'll, we'll discuss it. Right? Allah, imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with us like that. There'd be no one on earth. Everything would be gone. Right? Remember, we all be, operate, we're between two letters, the kaf and the noon. Kun. At some point, we could be mayakun. <laughs> we could be out of here. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still allows us to exist, still allows us to live, means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us chance after chance after chance, and He wants us to have that same attitude, that same perspective with other people. Shaykh, can I ask a question? Yes. Can you give us a, a, maybe a, a tool or something, something that would enable us to distinguish between we are getting angry for ourselves or angry for you know, angry in the selfish way that you're speaking about, or angry in terms of for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that his commands have been breached. Can you give us something that we can we can denote as an example? It would be clear. It would be that's a good question. It would be very clear as to why the person's um, getting angry. If the person has um, if the it's clear in, in the reason for in the articulation. 
right? What are the reasons that the person says? So, um, you know, why are you getting, why are you upset? Well, because he hurt me, or because he did this to me, or this. And when you personify, when the I comes out, then it becomes you are the reason. That's your nefs that's coming out. Now you may have a point. Right? You, you may the person might legitimately be a victim, might be malum, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives them that right to speak out. But even then, when speaking out about being wronged themselves, like he hurt my feelings, he oppressed me, he did this to me, or she did this to me, etc. The reason why the person is upset has to be very clear. And that's only, only the person can tell. Me. So if someone can wrong me, and I might be upset at them because they wronged me. Right? But am I upset with them because they wronged me uh, in the sense that I'm, I shouldn't be wronged because I'm a nice person? Right? Or who are they to wrong me? I didn't do anything to them. Or you shouldn't wrong me because according to the, the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm, I'm not to be touched. You have transgressed. right? You've gone across the limits. And I'm angry with you because you went ac across the limits. You crossed the line. And because you crossed the line, I got hurt. Because you crossed the line. I'm hurt because I'm hurt. But the, the asal of why I'm, why I'm angry is because you crossed the line, not because I got hurt. Now, how do you determine this? It's because the person who gets, if you get hurt, your hurt and pain comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right? Yes, the person crossed the line. They did something they weren't supposed to do. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for that to happen. He willed for that hurt to come to you. Okay? He willed for it to come to you, so that means that in that situation, in that case, you were supposed to get that hurt, and there was nothing that you could have done to get out of to not have that hurt. So your job is to is to deal with that in one way. As it relates to the person, they made an error in crossing the line. And that's you know, we have to separate those two: the will of Allah subhanahu wa taala and the person's choice in crossing the line. So your anger is addressed at that person who's crossed the line because they crossed the line. Okay, that hurt. Even if they didn't cross the line, it would have come to you in some other way. That's very important to understand. Um, the edge of the maktul is the edge the 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 time span for the person that's killed is that time. If 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 my time to die is is um, you know if I'm supposed to, if a person is supposed to die because of a gunshot wound and uh, for some reason the gun doesn't doesn't work that person will still die from a different cause their time is up even though the cause might have changed the time is up so what's going to happen to you is going to happen to you but that's a separate issue from people crossing the line okay so you're not upset so you have to be very careful to make a distinction between those two so what what you get upset about is the fact that the human condition, the human beings that are around us, put, are put, put us in situations where we react to the, either they're crossing the lines or staying within those boundaries. Okay? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who put the line. So when you become angry, you have to, the, the impulse is to, is to react, is to become angry. But the Prophet وسلم, challenged us to not give in to that impulse, but to think about it first. And then, when we think about it, to put it in the right way. So maybe the first reaction would be to become angry for our own nefs reasons. But then the Prophet ﷺ challenges not to leave it at that. And to not allow a pattern to develop where that becomes our norm. So in the beginning, yes, we, most of us will start at the level of becoming angry for the sake of, for the sake of our own nefs. Because we've been hurt because of who we are, etc. But when you stop... And think about the fact that there's no difference between me and you and she and her and everyone else. We're all ibad. So what's, why should I not receive this hurt? There's nothing special about me that makes me safe from being hurt or from being disrespected. There's nothing s sacred about me in that sense, right? So in that sense, you have to take, you can't get mad at somebody for hurting you. Because you're going to be hurt one day and you're going to be hurt one day and you're going to be hurt. We all have 
a qadr that says we're going to wala nabluwannakum bi shay'in we're going to test you with everything all of you will be tested so if we're going to get mad at something we can't get mad at the fact that we're being tested we have to get mad at other people failing their test and it hurting us that's what we're angry at does that make sense when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded them otherwise so um, that's what's being talked about here so the, 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 the path of tazkiyat al-qalb, the path of purifying the heart, invokes and demands that we become aqli people, rational people in our conduct. Just because we have a desire to do something does not make it okay to do it. Just because we have what's called a malaka, uh, an instinct, right, second nature, a reaction to do something does not make it the right thing to do. Just because it's natural does not make it halal. Does that make sense? At every point, we have to check our nature, check our reaction against the sharia. There's, there's three levels, three, three uh, uh, mizans, three, three levels of scales to check your behavior. One is the sharia. First one. If in a situation, someone does something to you, and you think, what does the Sharia have to say about my reaction? I'm going to react. What does the Sharia say about it? If you know the answer, then you are required to act on that answer. Well, the Sharia says haram, so I can't do it. The Sharia says halal, so I can do it. This is the first mizan. But maybe everyone doesn't know the Sharia very well. So that's not a good scale for some people. So then they go to the second scale. And the second, level, the second scale is what's called uh, iqtida or ittiba. And that is using the example of our pious teachers in the past. Right. So we see an example in the life of Aisha. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. We see a situation that's similar to ours in the example of Abu Bakr, of Uthman, of Imam Shafi. I love the example of Abu Hanifa. Love this example. It's so, it's completely out of this way. It's not even on planet Earth. It's not an example you'd find on this planet. Do you know the example of Abu Hanifa where he had this neighbor, and the neighbor who's uh, he's not Muslim, or whether he's Muslim or not is really irrelevant, but it's, per but it's really powerful because what happens at the end, and he's playing his music all the time loud, so it disturbs Abu Hanifa uh, in his house, and he's, um, he's always partying. And he takes the bottles of alcohol and he tosses them uh, out the window into Abu Hanifa's yard. And uh, every morning Abu Hanifa, so he stops sleeping at night. And Abu Hanifa starts to stay up and pray to Hajjad and everything as, in, in his, uh, as he's becoming Imam. And for 40 years he makes Fajr with the same wudu he made with Isha. He had, he, he, with the same wudu he had for Isha, 40 years. So this guy's playing his music every night and drinking and things of this nature. One day, one night, Abu Hanifa doesn't hear anything. No music coming from the house. Wakes up in the morning, goes out in his yard. No beer bottles in his yard. I'm using today's language. No alcohol bottles in his yard. Second day comes, no music at night, no parties, no guests. Wakes up in the morning, no alcohol bottles in the yard. Very strange. Third day, that night, no parties, no music from his neighbor's house. In, wakes up in the morning, goes out, nothing in the yard, no bottles. Abu Hanifa starts to, where's my, what's going on with my neighbor? And he starts to inquire in the marketplace and from people he knows about his neighbor. And he's told, he's informed that his neighbor has been locked up for a debt he didn't pay. Abu Hanifa goes, and re, goes to, the, to, to the Qadi and gets the debt, pays the debt for his neighbor. And goes and bails his neighbor out of jail. When he bails his neighbor out of jail, he apologizes to his neighbor for, the, for, have, for having his neighbor wait three nights in jail. And he apologized to him so profusely and he, that he said, it took me three days to find you. Please forgive me for ignoring your rights. For had I known earlier, I would have been here the moment they tried to lock you up. And the man was so shocked this man, he didn't care about Abu Hanifa. He didn't, 
you know, he's trying to upset him and trying to embarrass him and trying to entice him to get upset and get angry and show, show the community, see this guy is not a big deal. He's so shocked that immediately he becomes Muslim on the spot. And he becomes one of the students of Abu Hanifa. You know? It's amazing uh, people's, our, the reaction of our scholars uh, because they take this from our, our predecessors. So the second level is when you read the biography and the lives of people of the past, you see that Allah Ta'ala tested them with things that are beyond our control. And so you see how they reacted and this becomes a model for us to implement in our own lives. So the second level is, is, is ittiba, the pattern of following. And so we follow what we know. But it's like that for your parents, could be for your grandparents. Maybe you know your mom was in a situation, your grandma was in a situation, your aunt, your uncle was in this situation, and you see the, 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 the etiquettes that they used in getting out of the situation and dealing with it. And that becomes a model. You go with precedents, examples that you know. So you're still, just because you're not, you don't know the Sharia, it does not exempt you from being a person of good character. Good character is also passed down in examples of the past. And then if that doesn't work, the third level is looking at the nafs. When, you're in a, when you are in a, a, a situation where you're tested, when somebody's trying to upset you and puts a lot of stress on you, whatever your nafs wants to do, you, go, you do the opposite. If you have no example from the sharia, you have no examples to draw upon in people's personal lives in the past, <coughs> You go against your nafs. Why? In the nafs al amaratum bisu. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, quoting uh, one of the prophets, that my nafs automatically leans and inclines to evil. Just like the compass, what direction does it point? Any compass? No. North. Automatically, it goes north. Right. You're not going to change the basic nature of the compass. The nafs is the similar way. The basic na nature of the nest is that it is pulled towards suit, towards bad things and evil. So when its first reaction, the first reaction of the nest, when it is tested, is to do a bad thing. Somebody hits you in the face, your first reaction is to hit back. You might stop yourself, that's your akal, that's your intellect stopping yourself. Your nest wants to hit them. Your nest wants to fight back, that's the nest. So the, if you have no other example, go against the nafs. That's what the Prophet is telling us to do. Don't act when you're angry. Stop. Think. Think about why you're angry. Why you should be. Should you be angry? If you should be angry, why should you be angry? And then how should that translate on the ground in terms of amal, behavior? Okay. Backbiting. Agriba. Uh, Backbiting is to mention something about a person concerning their persons, their personality, yani. speech, actions, religion, dunya, dress, house, anything, to mention something about anybody knowing that if they were to hear it, it would make them upset. Now that's a really powerful thing. If you're talking about me, or if I'm talking about you, and I'm with someone, I say, oh, you know, uh, Halima, you know, she's, Halima, you know, she's tall. And I know that if Halima were to hear that, she wouldn't like for me to say that. Maybe it's a compliment. Maybe I mean a compliment. Maybe I think good things about tall people. But for Halima, she's self-conscious about it. It's like saying Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she mentioned that a woman was tall. The Prophet said, you've backbit her. She said, Ya Rasulullah, it's true. He said, well, if it was, if it was not true, it would be a lie. She just mentioned the lady was tall. But the Prophet ﷺ knew that that woman didn't like to be called tall. So if she heard that, she wouldn't like that. It's a sin. It's backbiting. So if you don't know 100% that when you're talking about somebody, if you don't know that, that you're saying good things about them, that what they think was, is good is really good, then you shouldn't say anything. You should be quiet. So you have to be very careful about what you say about people. It's during the death, um, when the Prophet Sallallahu was dying, um, his wife, um, Ruqayya, I think her name was, um, not Ruqayya, uh, SubhanAllah, Muhammad, 
what's the, I'm forgetting the wife of the Prophet who was once Jewish and she became Safia. Safia, thank you, Safia. Safia, she always got a lot of stress because she was really never fully accepted in the beginning as a legitimate wife of the Prophet Sallallahu because she was, she was Jewish and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there had been people from the Jewish community that had tried to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so a lot of the Sahabas thought that, oh, this woman Sophia, she's really trying to kill and assassinate the Prophet, and there was a lot of, you know, she had a lot of stress from uh, the community, even from the wives of the Prophet, so the Prophet's dying, and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's, and she, and she loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so much, and she um, was so grieved at, at, at his being on his deathbed, she said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, I see you in so much pain. She said, Wallahi, she said, I wish this pain would leave you and come to me right now. This is how much I love you. She said, I wish this pain would leave you and come to me. Yeah, SubhanAllah, look at the love. And then uh, the other wives of the Prophet saw somewhere around, upon hearing that, they started to... Uh, like look at each other's eyes and like make comments. You know how you look at people and, and you make comments like, mm, you know, you have this. I'm from the south. You know, our, some, you know, some some folks I know. You know, a lot of the the old rules of, of, of the ghetto where I grew up. You know, you know that the eyes have a have a language unto themselves. You know, there's sign language and there's eye language as well. You know, you, I know sisters when they roll their eyes. Oh my goodness, it doesn't mean something positive. You know, so it's funny they they use. Uh, Allah Ta'ala says, Woe to the, the people that they backbite using their eyes. Because the eyes have kalam. So the, the, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they started communicating with each other about what she said with their eyes. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his deathbed. This is a man who, I mean, it's one thing if he's in Medina and telling people, you know, Amr bil ma'aruf nahi an munkar, commanding what's right, forbidding what's wrong when he's young, strong, and vibrant. This man is on his deathbed bed and he checks his wives and he says you have just uh, oh he says he tells them go wash your go wash your mouth that's what he says and they said I think it was Aisha or Hafsa why Ya Rasulullah he said so I said he said because you just did riba of your sister you just backbit your sister he said I swear by Allah what she just said she's sincere hey Mukhlisa she's sincere about what she said she, what she, her, the feelings that she has, she's sincere. She's saying that from her heart. What you just did was backbite her. You challenge her, you say she's not sincere just because she made this comment. You know. So backbiting is very, very, very careful. If you backbite somebody, yes, you have to not only apologize, you have to wash your mouth. Very, very, very bad because of the smell. The person who lies, the person who backbites. What happens is your ruh, you don't, even if you're chewing gum, you have bad smell. Your ruh, your soul, produces a smell when you lie, when you backbite. The Prophet ﷺ said that the malaika around you fly away at the, person, at the smell from the person who lies and backbites. This is a hadith. Just like you know, flies, when they, they go away, the malaika, poof, they go poof, they, go, they leave at what is produced, what comes from the soul of the person who lies and back by, hold on just, shut up just a second, hold your, hold your question so um, if this thing you mention is true, it is backbiting, if it is untrue it is slander and this is worse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and do not backbite one another would one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead uh, brother, yes shut up. Good question. And what, what are the exceptions to that rule? There are exceptions. First exception is when you've been wronged and you have to seek your rights. That's the first exception. So the second, so for example, someone has you know, harmed you, victimized you, hurt you, and you are in a position where a lot of times this comes up in divorce cases where women have to talk about, have to talk to their attorneys about what their husbands uh, did. And they're scared to mention it because of the of the sin of backbiting. Well, in that case, it's not backbiting. In that case, because you're trying to correct a wrong, you're trying to protect yourself. It's not backbiting. The second, I hope hands are coming up. Okay, 
Yes, let me go to this list and then you may. Yes. Would it also be in reference to a woman who has to speak up for her children? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll come to that in a second. Yes, Mary. Is that the exception that would also go into the same group? People coming just seeking counseling? Yes, without a doubt. And so it's not like, it's not necessarily a right, but they're coming for comfort and right. consolation. Right. Exactly. Now, the rule is this. When you're giving information, you give, it's just like the doctor, when you go to a doctor's office. When you go to a doctor's office, if you're a man and the woman is a doctor, or you're a woman and the physician is a man, when there's, when there's opposite genders there, and they want to do an examination, if they want to examine your legs, they're not going to let you uncover everything. All right? Even, even non-Muslim physicians will not do that. There's still etiquettes. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, we live in a place that has really good etiquettes. Uh, not to mention people are afraid of lawsuits. But the real reason, that may be the reason. Um, but the point is, you are only going to reveal what is necessary for the treatment. Same thing when conveying information in that situation. So you reveal information that is necessary to accomplish the goal to bring the outcome of what you need. So if your goal, for example, is counseling, then... Uh, you'll mention things, you should mention things that are relevant to the need for counseling. If your goal is to prosecute somebody, send somebody to jail, then you're, go then you're going to mention information at that level. But the level of counseling is not like the level of sending somebody to jail. You see what, you see what I'm saying? So the type of information you reveal in the counseling session, if it goes way beyond that and you start to mention things that are not relevant to that, that have no benefit, right? then you go into the realm of backbiting in that context. So it's like self-defense. Someone tries to attack you. Let's say they attack you um, with their hands. You are not allowed in the Sharia to all of a sudden uh, you know, pull out a machine gun and, st and, and put 16 bullets inside of it. Right? You know, in the Sharia, uh, if you pull a knife, that's okay. But if you start to pull out a machine gun and put 16 bullets in them, at that point you've, you've, you've gone beyond your limits, your frame of behavior. That becomes haram, and that becomes qatl, murder. Okay? So you, de you defend yourself to the degree necessary. When you're seeking your rights, you seek your rights to the degree necessary. You talk about how you've been victimized, talk about what has been what, how you've been wronged to the degree necessary, and all that is not backfighting. The moment you go into areas that don't have anything to do with that, then that's backfighting. Right. So, the, you know, you're trying to get a divorce, and then you're mentioning things, oh, you know, he always burned the food anyway, and, you know, he was always cheap and stuff. Well, that's not relevant. That's backfighting now, because that's not pertinent to accomplishing the goal at hand, okay? Second thing is in marriage. When you are, so the first is ending a marriage, the second is starting a marriage. What, if you're interested in somebody and you research about them and um, in the process of that research you come into contact with someone who knows a lot about them, that person is required to mention what they know about the person, both good and bad, if the bad is relevant for that, in, for, for that context. This is a little tricky because um, some things you don't have to mention, you're not required to mention. But things like, let's say the guy in the past abused his wife, right, in the past, for example. He's known as a domestic violence perpetrator. That you have to convey to that sister that's looking to marry. That's not backbiting. And if you don't convey it, then the sin of not conveying it is bigger than any sin connected to backbiting. Okay? Because you put that person in, in harm, and you have the ability to inform them so that they can protect themselves. So that's another situation where backbiting uh, is permissible. Finally, um, yes, Mary. Um, in those situations, do you, is it, are you responding to specific questions, or is someone saying, how is, is a person that you can just divulge? You can divulge information, yeah, even if they're not asking, because they don't know. They don't know. So if they're saying, I'm trying to marry this person, can you tell me something about them, and you know that this person, you know, has drinks, or you know that this person... Um, has a, there's a warrant out for their arrest, or you know that this person doesn't pray, or you know that this person has um, personality disorder, and they're not on their medication, you have to mention that. But what if, what if there's some kind of reform, right? So I'm, I know somebody who is 
and I know that in the past somebody was had to be or cheated in their marriage or something. And I've I've known that about this person. And then years later, somebody's asking, I don't know what's happened in those those years. No, this is right now. So this, but is, I know, this is current. Yeah. Stuff. So yeah. So no, years no. later, somebody he's, he's, that person is, is being inquired about. Yeah. No. 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 This is current information. Okay. Yeah. Good question. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, you're not required to talk about what people did before they converted to Islam, things like that. Or you know, even you're even in the past. Yeah, yeah. This is current information that you know is something that's still in the clinical realm. What we say ongoing. Okay, something that's still ongoing. So if you're not sure, is then you don't mention it. No, you have to know it. You have to know for a fact something you hear about, wonder about, not happened ten years ago. Not sure if it's no. That's just then you're into hearsay. You have to know for sure. Because the person is coming to you for ilm, not for dhan. They're coming to you for, for certain knowledge, not speculated information and gossip. You, they come for ilm, knowledge, you have to give them knowledge. If you're not sure, you are not allowed to disparage that person's character based upon hearsay or lack of information. You have to present what you know is the current situation as it is, and you have to provide evidence to that too. Absolutely. Otherwise, you disparage that person's character and that's backbiting, it's, it could be namima, lying, all of that stuff. And you, not to mention the situation you put that person in. Um, so yeah, it's very serious. But if it's an ongoing thing, present, today, and you know it, you have to mention it. Mm -hmm. So you also, you mentioned in that lineup, mental, like not yeah, taking their medication. Yeah, absolutely. What about physical? Defects, physical situations? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Our dean is no joke, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What happens if there's a change that you don't know about? Then you don't know. You're not, you know. But if it's current and you know it's current, but then the person, let's say the next day, changed their situation, then that's different. But at the time that you mentioned it to them, it was current yeah, I mean, and that was it. Say like within a week, you know something is happening, but mm -hmm. it changes without you knowing that. You're, not, ex you're not responsible for that. You're not responsible. Okay. Is there one, one more in terms of uh, position, leadership, and things of that nature? What do you mean? Could you? Hmm. You know, just talking about leaders. I mean, that happens all the time. Hmm. It's an individual gossip about the uh, quality of the leadership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You can speak general. Brand making a mistakes yeah. in the salad. Yeah, the that stuff has to be corrected. Um, but it's, it has to be corrected on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, or one -on, not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one in, um, not in the public realm, in the private realm, you know, so that with person, the with the leader, with the individual, absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, two things yeah. are these, but first, the department of counseling, is that the counseling mean like, just you have to go to a particularly licensed counselor, or can you, if you go to like, just to a friend, let's see. Good question. Both. You can go to a good friend for Nasiha, absolutely. The absolutely. The thing is the courtesy of an event. Yeah. You know, for example, if you're, for example, if you say there's a guy who has a divorce because he was abusing his wife, but he's not married anymore to be abusing five years later. How do you know if that's current or not? I would, I, I yeah. can't say I'm, I'm a little troubled by you saying that, you know, three years ago, no, the, you need. That's something that condition is a very good question. Um, if a person has, if a person has a ha has, especially habits or situation that don't just become reformed, that the tendency is for them to persist unless there's intervention, like domestic violence or like violence, for example. Uh, then those things you have to mention. If you mention that this person is known, especially in the past have abused people in their family or something. You don't know if they've gotten intervention, but this person is thinking about establishing a new family. You still have to mention that situation because of the high risk uh, that that person is going into. Absolutely. If this person's history is such that, or th ideally speaking, this is in the case where the person has not informed, the, the guy has not informed the woman that's thinking about marrying him in the first place. Right? Um, and it may be the case that the, 
brother or the, is sending that sister to a reference, so the reference can tell them about it or can give sort of an objective analysis uh, about it. Maybe the person doesn't want to confide, talk about it themselves. Right? But if you know the paradigm case is the case where information is not being told to the person. This sister, I'm just calling sister, could be a brother. This person does not know and no one's telling them. Okay? Then in that case, you have a responsibility to mention it, for sure. So the paradigm case in the Kiba example is the person who's looking for marriage, the other person has a big problem, no one's talking about it. And if, if that continues, this sister, this brother could walk into a situation that is very detrimental to them. In that case, when they, the person goes to them or they go to the person, they have something to tell you, it's about the person you're interested in, this is the situation that I'm aware of that happened. This person had this habit, and this habit caused this catastrophic situation in their house, in their whatever. I thought you should know about it because it's known that this person has this habit. This is, no, this is what's known. And then you're informing the person and they hear about it for the first time. That is not Giba. That's not backbiting. That's not backbiting. Yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? It, yes and no. Because there are two kind of things that are coming into it. One is, you know, it's known, which it, maybe you know. I mean, there's, like, there's situations in our community where people that are even publicly well respected, mm -hmm. but privately only a few people know certain things about them. Maybe they know why you know, marriage ended, but no one else in the community knows. And that's, that's one aspect of it that, that kind of troubles me because, you know, it says that if, if a particular person or a small group of people know, that doesn't mean everyone will know. Right. And so, and then the second thing is just the first is coming to put it down and so This, well, but this, that information would come from somebody who knows it, though. That's the thing. Right. That information would only be would, would only come from someone who knows it is a habit. It would be, it'd be the equivalent of inside information. Can you take one event and take a habit? No, you cannot. So but you can say it's an event. You can, you can say you can. Yeah, it's not a habit, but you can say it happened. Okay. It happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it was, yes, sister. What do you mean, though? Could you? If, you, if somebody's asking you about a family member, yeah. or like, I don't know, parents, or some, someone that's more closely related rather than just somebody that you know, does it differ? If they're asking, like, about that person, for, for you to provide details about them? Yeah. Yeah, no, no I just, you, if it's, a, if it's something that is, you're talking about for marriage in the context, context of I marriage? Mean, or, for marriage or, or something like marriage, business, whatever. Or reference, or, yeah. yeah. Um, you, 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 you're required to tell the truth. Let's say um, you, um, let's say somebody comes to you about a sibling, right? Or, you know, someone for a job asks you for a recommendation, um, and um, and they, you know, rec they they ask, they call you about your sibling, for example, and they want you to give a recommendation as to whether they can do the job. And you give a recommendation that they're a great person, they can do the job, and you know 100% they're incompetent, right? They're not gonna do a good job, and it's the type of job that requires serious competence and stuff. You're responsible at that point. You are responsible. Um, so the fact that they're your sibling is a good thing, but when you're asked to testify, to give reference, you're required to tell the truth, okay? Um, and that's one of the characteristics about the Ummah of Muhammad is that we are an Ummah of, sh of truthful shahada, right, truthful testimony. So if when we refer or when we talk about people in our family, then if we, you know, if somebody comes to me about marriage to my sister, for example, and they're very serious about it and they really want to know details about my sister and things of that nature, then I'm going to talk to her first and let her know so-and-so is going to, I'm going to have a conversation with so-and-so, this is what I'm going to tell him, 
about you. You know, are you going? Is that a, you know? We're going to have this conversation. This is what I'm going to say. You know. Now, if you don't want me to say it, then are you going to have this conversation with them? I'll not. I'll withhold it on the condition that you tell this person about it. Right. But you, this person can't come in blind. Right. Vice versa. If I'm trying to get married, my sister and I are going to have a conversation. I'm going to say, you know, they're going to come to you, and you can tell them whatever you want about me, good or bad. Right. So. The, 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 the first thing to do is to inform them of what you're going to say when it comes to things that are sort of touchy and sticky, things like that. Right? The other way to do it, which is not the best way, but it is permissible to do it like this, is to mention the thing first to the person and then go back to your sibling and say, this is what happened. Right? This is what I mentioned. This person came to me. They asked me about you. I didn't have time to discuss it with you or let you know, but in the interest of transparency and this private and truthfulness, um, I, I, can, I told this information to them and I asked them not to convey it to anyone else, right? The ahsan, the best way is to mention it to your siblings or whatever first, you know. But if someone's coming to them for marriage or business or something like that, you have to tell the truth about the, about the situation, yeah. And if nobody's coming to you, but you have information that you're withholding, is it your responsibility to push your sibling or relative to come forth with it? Or yes, yes, yes. You should advise them that they should Beyond advice, that's all you can do. That's all you can do. If you think that giving that information to that third person will cause a greater fitna, don't give it. Don't give it. But you should advise your sibling, your sister, brother, to have a conversation with that person, be truthful and honest, because if they don't, Allah Ta'ala can bring things out. Allah Ta'ala has ways of bringing the truth out. Okay? Yes, Sister Mary. So let's say if there is a marriage in question, it's uh, one of the siblings who is going to get married, and you have an information that you know that the parent or that person may not really accept this, this advice or don't get it seriously, uh, and just you say, okay, I just keep it for myself because I don't want to get problem with the family. Is there then? I'm not saying anything, while I know this can change something. Am I uh, getting in, like? with my God, I'm not saying anything which... No, no, you're fine. You're not, res you're not, um, you're not responsible to, to, to make problems, you know, to, to, to cause things to happen. Um, if you think that with, that there is, a lot, there is fa'ida, there's benefit to come by not saying anything, then you don't say anything. But if you think that by staying silent, this will cause more harm than speaking, then you're required to speak. And if you don't know, if you don't know, then the best thing to do is not, uh, maybe not to say anything, but to encourage the other person to speak out. No, afterwards, you know that this marriage went wrong. And afterwards? Hmm. Even though you kept it for yourself, you heard many things have been said, and then I'm like, okay, I know they're not going to hear from me, or they're not just going through it. Well, then, like you're saying anything would not have done anything, would not have made a difference then. So it, it wouldn't have done anything anyway. Yeah. You're speaking about it would have been no, no use. No use. Wallahu alam. The Prophet said, page 31, middle page 31 after the ayah, stay away from backbiting. For backbiting is worse than fornication and zina. Very interesting. Stay away from backbiting because backbiting, riba, is worse then fornication, zina. Since a man may fornicate and repent, may make toba and be forgiven, but the one who backbites will not be forgiven until the friend forgives him. Backbiting is a sin between two people. So even though you make toba for that, you repent for it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forgive until the person forgives it. Okay. Whereas with zina, although it's bad, it's a sin, uh, it's, you didn't take the right of another person such that they have to forgive you. Okay? That's what's being said here. When there's sins between people, it's, it should be taken almost more serious because of the rights that are involved. Okay? Yes? So if you were in a big fight about someone and you no longer had contact with them and you don't know if they forgave you or so not. So what you do, good question. If you no longer have contact with them or you feel like if you were to go to them and say 
uh, you know, Khalil, man, you know, brother, you know, I mentioned to this person that, you know, X, Y, and Z. If I know that if I say that to him, he's going to be like, what? What, man, you, you know, and then he just lays out on me and then we fight. And if I know it's going to be a creative fit, a big scene, I can't divulge it. In that case, in the absence of being able to go to the person, you can't go to them because it creates a bigger fitna or you can't find them. What you do is you give sadaqa, you feed poor people on their behalf. And you constantly, constantly make dua to Allah to bring you together and to correct things between you on the Day of Judgment. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about people who, uh, they, both people are raised on, the, on Yom Al-Qiyamah and one of them has a haq over the other, has a right over the other? The person, the, the mazloom, the oppressed person will say, Ya Rabb, give me my haq. I want my right from that person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will first start with the person's good deeds and transfer them over. They're good deeds. And then if the person is satisfied, then they're satisfied. But if they're not satisfied, if it's a big, big right that was violated, and we know in the times we live in, it's scary. Then after the person has no more good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will start to take the, the bad deeds of the madhloom, of the oppressed person, and give them to the oppressor. So the bad person who did the, committed the crime, that person's bad deeds will go from here up, 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 until the person is satisfied. The innocent person is satisfied. Even with animals. Do you know the hadith on the Day of Judgment with animals? You know animals don't have hisab, reckoning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his justice will resurrect all animals first before, before the, 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 the hisab of people. We'll all be standing there. First Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us his justice, he will resurrect all animals. And any animal that was killed by another animal, that animal would take its right on the day of judgment. And after all animals have taken their rights against animals that killed them, then Allah ta'ala will render them back to dust. So even the dead animals, uh, excuse me, the animals that were, vict that were eaten, that, were, uh, uh, that fought each other and were injured, things like that. I feel bad for the black widow. <laughs> you know, the black widow spider, she kills all the husbands she mates with. <laughs> you know, she spins the web, mates with the husband and kills it. You know, then another one and kills it. You know, I feel bad for her husband. This is the same thing. Allah will destroy those animals and then the mizan will be brought forth and the human judgment will take place then after that then the jinn subhanallah so this is a very serious time the prophet said you'll either get the good deeds of the bad person or and if you're not satisfied then your bad deeds will start to be transferred to them you don't want to be in that situation is the point so that's why if you can't find the person or you can't go to the person you have to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ya Allah, on the Day of Judgment, make things right between us so that we don't fight on the Day of Judgment. And that's why you give sadaqah on their behalf. So that the good deed of sadaqah, it goes into their, 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 their bank account, so to speak, of hisab. Yes, Is the hasanat. Is that satisfaction based on the individual being satisfied or based on like, something in the sharia? No, it's, it's based on the individual. individual yes, yeah, yeah. Even in the, the, mm -hmm. the sharia court, um, you know, in Islamic law, there is no such thing like we have in the American law here, legal system, where the state gives a punishment or the state brings a, a charge against the person. You know, it's always the state of New York against the person. That doesn't exist. It's the victim against the perpetrator. And if the victim wants justice, then the court has to give what the victim wants. If the victim wants forgiveness, then the court case is closed right so it's up to the it's up to because the person's been harmed so whatever they want this is why when you apologize to people you apologize and ask if there's anything that you can do to to, to make them feel better you know, this is why okay let's continue yes one last question <clears throat> so the benefit of being uh, forgiving though is that if you forgive Allah will forgive you yes absolutely there is no need for the person of intellect to be troubled by the backbiting uh, now what happens when you are backbiting? When people talk about you? 
No need for a smart person to get upset over this. Indeed, it should gladden us. It should make you happy. That's a paradox. It doesn't make you happy. It's very traumatic. But it should make you happy, is the point. Why? Since on the day of judgment, uh, since the, the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will be to take as many deeds as he wishes from the scales of the one who backbites and award them to the persons who have been offended. And when, whenever someone talks about you, you get hasanat, good deeds. You know the situation where the man, he's talking, he's saying, he's, he's calling bad names uh, uh, to Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Right? This is very powerful when you even talk to somebody in their face, uh, to their face, not just behind their back. When you talk to somebody to their face and you're criticizing them and you're calling them bad things, you're calling them names, and Abu Bakr was quiet and his head was down and the Prophet ﷺ was there and he was very upset at what he was hearing. And then Abu Bakr got so tired, he responded. And the Prophet ﷺ, Checked Abu Bakr. Look at that. He said, Abu Bakr, why did you respond? He said, when you responded, when you were quiet, the angels were going around you supporting you. And they were protecting you and they were telling the other person, whatever names you call him, may they go back to you. Whatever names you call them, may they go back to you. The angels were protecting you from those names hitting you. The silent person who is victimized, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the malaika to protect them, although we don't see it, we don't feel it, that you're protected. But then he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you responded, right, when you reacted, because it was in your nature, because it was in your instinct, because you were, you felt, you got upset, right, and you reacted, the malaika left you, they left your defense, they stopped supporting you. So the person who's backed by the, the again, the nature, the natural reaction is to respond. You want to respond, but why do you want to respond? Because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel strong. If no one takes up for you, well, you've got to stand up for yourself. But wait a minute now, but we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stands up for us. The person of intellect, of qalb, knows this. We believe in the unseen. And there is immense support and help that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides those who believe in him. This is why we believe in the unseen. So we don't need to stand up for ourselves all the time because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends support for us when we are wrong. Now if we do wrong, then it's different. Then that support leaves us. Right. Yes? Uh, is it wrong? So is it wrong to defend yourself like during a physical... No, 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 no. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. But how you defend yourself is the question. So, you know, somebody's talking about you and yelling at you and saying things to you and, uh, you know, oh, you're stupid, you don't know how to do this, where'd you get your degree from, 7-Eleven, like, are you, you know, what's that? And you say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of this, and you know what I have, and you start to give it back to them, at that point you... you no, I you, mean, as the things get... Physical, yeah. When they escalate, well, physical? Yeah, if someone was to attack you... No, you have to attack yourself. I mean, no. <laughs> 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 you have to uh, defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah, no, but you defend it. But if you can defend yourself by, uh, you know, I always recommend um, brothers and sisters to 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 um, to take martial arts. The Prophet Sallallahu recommended that his uh, that his ummah take uh, three arts. One is horseback riding, the other is archery, and the other is swimming. Right? These are major sunnas: horseback riding, archery, and swimming. The Prophet encouraged his ummah. Right? Uh, under archery, um, why? Um, uh, Archery, very, very, very profound. Why archery? Because if you have a target in front of you, right, and the target is here, when you want to shoot the arrow at the target, if you shoot, anybody who learns archery knows this, if you shoot straight at the target, does it hit? No, not if, not if you're outside. Why doesn't it hit the target if you shoot straight at it? Huh? Because of the wind. Because of the wind. You have to take so many things into consideration. That's why the Prophet wanted archery. To open the minds of his ummah so that we take so many factors into consideration when we decide to hit a target. So when you, hit the, when you look at the target, you, if you aim straight, you'll miss. If you take nothing into consideration in your decision making, you miss. You, you hit the wrong thing, you make mistakes. You have to aim a little off. Why? To the left or to the right? 
little higher, a little lower. Why? Because there's things happening around you that impact the effect of your actions. This is why. So, very profound. So, martial arts is the same thing, and I recommend all Muslims to take Aikido. Who's taking Aikido in here? No one's taking Aikido? Oh. Aikido is 100% self-defense. 100%. You don't hit anybody. You don't kick anybody. Someone comes at you, you not only defend yourself, but the person's injured because of their own energy. <laughs> they are injured, they break their bones because they come at you with their force, their energy, and it injures them. So when they try to hit you, you deflect it and make them fall, and they injure themselves because of themselves. Aikido is a phenomenal art. It's the only martial art which is 100% reacting to people and allowing their force to impact them so that they learn their own lesson. Amazing, amazing, profound thing. But this is how we, to answer your question, this is how we react. Right? And it's not reaction, it's actually action. We are not people who react. We are people who act. Right? So that person attacks me, so I have to deal with their attack. Right? But maybe if they attack me with words, doesn't mean I pull out a gun and shoot them. That's, now I'm oppressing, and I'm not defending myself anymore. Okay? So yes, you are allowed to defend yourself, to stand up, because the Prophet also didn't like his ummah to be so humble that they look like they're low and not important. This is not the sunnah either. You have to have uh, honor for, 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 for being a part of the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam. But that honor should be with, 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 in, uh, with, with, uh, with humility. There's an honor, there's a way that you can hold your head up and not be arrogant. You defend yourself without attacking people. Standing up without putting others down. That is, the, that is, the, the, that is our tradition. There was a brother had a hand. Yeah. So I just wanted to go back to the hadith you just mentioned yes. uh, regarding slander. Um, and uh, I was thinking about the events in Bangladesh recently with all the controversy around the bloggers and uh, court cases being brought against them and the way people react to it. Good. Um, Good. Is there any connection between how we should react to this personally versus something like that? I mean, it, it, is it the same type of reaction that should result or I mean are people justified in their anger and things like that at the bloggers yeah or no. yeah so the all the riots that are happening of the course court not. cases no. um, even even the court cases yeah um, even the court cases is a good point I mean um, no um, we I mean, that's, I don't want to get like too long on that topic but they're not justified those those things are are, are wrong people have to have a certain amount of um, space and the jurists that talk about you know if a person condemns you know says bad things about the Prophet وسلم, or about his Sahabas um, like you can't lock those people up you know um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them um, those statements the things that are made are made from people most of the time that are just juhala they're just ignorant so we you know we we educate them not by rioting and destroying property and things of that nature but by being good examples and trying to educate them and train them. You know, one should pray for their, that they understand who the Prophet is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a really powerful hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Allah, Allah fi ashabi. He said, oh, fear Allah, be mindful of Allah concerning my ashab. La tattakhidhuhum ba'di gharada. Don't take them as a target to, to, to attack uh, after I'm gone. Faman ahabbahum fa bihubbi ahabbahum. Whoever loves my companions, it's because of love of me that they love my companions. Women abghadahum fabi bughdi abghadahum. And whoever dislikes my companions, it's because they dislike me that they dislike my companions. Women adahum fakat adani. And whoever harms them harms me. Women adani fakat adallah. And whoever harms me harms Allah. Like whoever insults me insults Allah. Women adallah fakat yushiku an yahudahu. And whoever tries to insult or disrespect Allah, try to harm Allah, Allah Ta'ala will take him like that. Very powerful hadith. So, we, we dislike these things that people write and do against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We should speak out against it. 
but we should not speak out at the level that uh, destroys people's property and oppresses them and then takes the person that does it and, 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 and crucify and criminalize them. They have done a crime. They have done, uh, committed a great sin. So they should be educated. Um, and they should be taught who the Prophet is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, there's so many people in the Prophet's time that insulted him. He never took them to court or thing. I mean, look at the reaction, the model of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, his first reaction, so powerful. Um, if you read the seerah, it's really, really powerful in how we should be. You know, when the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saw his uncle fall on the battlefield, imagine seeing your uncle die. Right? I'm very, very close to my uncle, Rahimahullah. Imagine seeing your uncle, he saw his uncle die, and then he saw this woman named Hind actually cut him open right, or take a piece of his liver and bite it, right, which is cannibalism. And when he saw the way that they mutilated Hamza, the Prophet being, being a bashar, being a human being, he swore, he swore an oath three times right, that he would kill 300 of them right, and that he would not stop until the Quraysh was decimated. He was angry. Then, later, years later, 10, 12 years later, that woman Hind comes before him to take her shahada. It took 10, 12 years. And yes, it took Fatim Mecca. Yes. But she came, she came before, and they were ready to, she, yeah, she was ready to die. They, they were ready to, in our words, convict her and crucify her and put her, you know, and take her life. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted her shahada. Now this does not mean that People who are victims should automatically forgive everybody, right? And we should all be driving VW bugs with like flowers on them, right? <laughs> but this is a model for what the Prophet's standard was, is what I'm saying. Now, we have been so far away from that standard that forget trying to uh, bring justice to the Prophet's eyes. We are doing injustice to our own neighbors in the process of trying to bring justice to the Prophet's eyes. Right? People rioting and things like that. They want court cases and justice about the Prophet when they're doing injustice to their own people. Right? I've yet to see anybody stand up for all those women that have been raped in Bangladesh. Right? I've yet to see anybody who's brought any court cases against uh, any of these situations where women's rights and children's rights have been completely just decimated. Right? But they want to focus on the Prophet who's already protected and gone. But what about the honor of those people that are still walking amongst you now? Right? So this is the, the, this is the state that, that our Ummah is in. So they're wrong. They're wrong. Um, they they have a the priorities are inverted. This is min amin shaytan. This is the, from the works of shaytan. Nani, meaning it, that we focus on things and we lose sight of the big picture. This is what I'm. This is from shaytan. Yeah. That does not mean that people should. I'm not saying people do not uh, are wrong in disliking what was done. People have legitimacy, and yes. Um, when, when, when people speak out bad against the Sahabas and against the Prophet and against this Ummah, we have to respond. We have to speak out. We have to say this is wrong and we have to challenge them on that. But the way we challenge is what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm sorry, and I just wanted to clarify this for myself. Mm. Am I allowed to think um, of that hadith as a good example to deal with a situation like that or is that kind of separate? No, it is. It is. It is of the prophetic model. You know, there's examples where the Prophet ﷺ was tough with people as well. But the prophetic model was that when someone comes to you at a low situation and you are exalted, you have the ability to show all of your power and might and bring down the house to them, you show compassion. Because that's the way you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deal with you. That is the model, is what I'm saying. Yes? Uh -huh. Just <clears throat> taking that so you brought up Hind and how uh, mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. like, accepted her. Mm -hmm. But do you know the, the actual individual who she hired to to do the uh, the act of you know killing Hamza? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know when he turned into a Muslim, didn't the Prophet ask him not to come in front of him again? Yeah, the Prophet didn't speak to him. So it is perfectly within his 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 purview to do that. Of course, but like, how do you like how does that? How you, you can forgive to... somebody, but not want to deal with them anymore. Mm -hmm. Not even f you can you can say I'm willing to move on, but I don't want to deal with you. But she's the one that hired him. Wouldn't she have higher culpability? Like, how do you, how do you, how does that? I guess my question is more like, how, how do you? Well, the prophet didn't deal with her either, so why? So he accept, She came to him for shahada, and he accepted it, and he wanted to show her as well that she, you know, her life was was going to be spared. But he didn't deal with her either after that, so why? So. Even with the No, he didn't. He didn't deal with him. No. We don't have 
uh, records that he, you know, interacted with her after that or anything. He took her shahada, she left, and he left. Okay. That was it. Yeah. But the actual killer, you're right. Yeah, he didn't even want to look at him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he, at the same time, he didn't do qatl, he didn't kill him either. He left him, but it's between him and Allah. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually a scarier situation if you think about it. Right? If you know, I mean, if I know that I have offended the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I would... I, I, I really want to have that take care of that person to person with the Prophet I would, it's worse for the Prophet to leave you by, by yourself with Allah that's worse right it's, it's worse for a person to not be spoken to right? that's actually worse that's a type of exile right? in the community so imagine if your dad or your mom just, just don't speak to you right? it's, it's worse than them actually spanking you and then speaking to, and saying, come on, let's have dinner tonight. That's actually worse. Them not speaking to you is worse. You know, if you know that your parents aren't talking to you, and they haven't, they're not going to talk to you, that's called hajar. And that's really, um, that's a lack of acceptance. And so while the Prophet Sallallahu acknowledged him as being Muslim, he was not able to embrace him as a community member. Right? And that's a totally different thing. And that means we don't have to embrace every person, but we don't have, our, we don't have to, disavow people from the community, but we don't have to embrace them either. We don't have to embrace them into our close realm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We, don't have to, we don't have to embrace every single Muslim on the planet. Right? We don't have to embrace them as fellow close community members, but we acknowledge their Islam. We acknowledge their being a part of the Ummat Muhammad. We give them their rights when we're in their presence, but embracing them is a little different. Yes, Dr. No, no, no. Close relatives that you have to. Um, the way you do it is different, though. Which you have to. You cannot close the door to them. You have to always keep the door open. Does that make sense? So you may not. You do not. You're not required to call them every Friday or Saturday to email them all the time. But if they need something, and they 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 they, they ask about you or they need something, you have to always respond. Right. So you're not required to be proactive. But if they come to you, you're required to react, be active, okay? Okay, so we are out of time. Um, Alhamdulillah, we finished backbiting. Next week, we'll talk about namima, slandering. Um, actually, what we can do... Bismillah, bismillah. What I'd like for everyone to do for homework is to read page 34... 35 and 36, the bottom of 34. Um, or actually, let's start with this. What I'd like for you to do for homework is read page 33, the section that's on um, excessive speech. So read page 33 and 34, 35 and 36, inshallah. Um, and then next week we will do tail bearing, namima. And um, if there are any questions from the homework, we can entertain that. And then after that, we'll, we'll go to 37, inshallah. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُوبَ عَلَيْنَا يَا مَوْلَانَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ تَوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ رَبَّنَا حَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا كُرَّةَ عَيْمٍ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا رب اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الاحياء منهم والاموات برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين والسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحه Um, I'm supposed to meet with a few social work students now, so those of you that are going to meet with me for a few minutes, um, we can meet right right in here, inshallah. Um, all of everyone else, um, we'll see you next week, inshallah, and I'll bring some. Assalamu alaikum.